On this episode of Conversations with Rich Bennett. A modern contemporary American woman whose husband divorced her. It's been a pretty acrimonious divorce. She's lost her university job and she wants to start over. And perhaps a bit foolishly, she thinks she can start over in a little Italian mountain town and she moves there and she she quickly angers the residents. She starts off well, but then she angers the residents because she's writing a blog and saying not very nice things about them and they discover it. So she's quite cut off. Ooh. And in this, she discovers uh, journals and letters of a former resident in her home uh, who had lived there a century earlier. Coming to you from the Freedom Federal Credit Union Studios, Harford County Living presents Conversations with Rich Bennett. Come on, man. Oh, man, you already said it. I was going to ask her if she remembered the things. My guest holds membership in both the Women's Fiction Writers Association and the Historical Novel Society. Furthermore, she has authored numerous short stories and three novels titled Three Coins, Dark Blue Waves, and The Shadow of the Apennines. Her forthcoming publication, which is, which is a collection of short stories, Drink Wine and Be Beautiful, is scheduled for release in May, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Correct. It is an honor to introduce to you Kimberly Sullivan, all the way from Rome, Italy. How you doing, Kimberly? Did I get that right? I, it's um, in May, right? When it's being released? You're correct. Yes, correct. It's May 26th. It's coming out. And Rich, thank you so much for having me here. I'm so glad to be with you across oh, the ocean. It's my honor. When I, yeah. Well, when I when you sent the thing through Podmatch, and I'm look because I well I told you I, I have bookings up through May. But I saw you're in Italy. Well, you're from here, from Boston. Boston. Did I say Boston? <laughs> Boston? No, Boston, Boston would be in I New York And I used to accent. say, then when I moved to New York, I had to lose the Boston accent quickly because they teased me so much. <laughs> right. And then you picked up the New York accent, right? <laughs> exactly. So then you went you know, from Boston, from Boston to New York. And then to D.C. <laughs> I don't even know. D.C. just <laughs> whatever. <laughs> yeah, that's just and a- then over to Italy. <laughs> so. Exactly. Uh, and I forgot where the hell I was going with that already. <laughs> God, man! But no, uh, actually, wait, because you were. Let's talk about that first. How did you meet your husband over in Italy, or did you meet him here? No, we met in actually. I, I because I used to work as a journalist. I worked in Prague, uh, which was then at the time Czechoslovakia. So uh, it was after right after the wall fell down, uh, well it was torn down, and uh, and it was an exciting time to be there. So I was working as a journalist then, doing a lot of uh, business coverage, which of course was very interesting at the time because uh, yeah, the whole economy had to completely remake itself. And um, I met my husband there because he's an historian and studies Eastern Europe. And right. so we met in a Czech class. So I often tell people, yeah, that's how you can go and meet men or women, go to a Czech class. <laughs> I'm not that's sure that's actually, actually true, but in our case, another... that is. <laughs> I had another guest on here who was teaching over in Prague. Oh, who's from it's here? It's a beautiful city. Yeah. Absolutely beautiful. I still go back quite a bit, but it's changed so much from then because it was just such an exciting time. And um, yeah, it was really interesting time to live there. Well, and you were a radio journalist, right? I did radio and television. So I used to do uh, okay. early morning television program. And then I would run over to my radio station. And then I worked with another television program only every once in a while doing programs with them. So I had a pretty packed day. And it was wow. mixed between. They let me also do a program in Czech, which was very funny because I um, I lived there for three years. I, I learned Czech quite well at the time, but I made a lot of mistakes. Right. It's very, um, it's a, it's like Russian. So the grammar is very difficult. But the wonderful thing is since they were very, they loved having Americans there at the time. So no matter what I did, they would say, yeah. oh, but you speak so beautiful. <laughs> and so it was very funny. I was a little bit spoiled. <laughs> so what? What made you decide to get into radio and television? I mean, was that your plan when you were in high school? 
Um, so I loved journalism and I loved, uh, I, I actually really liked politics. So I started working in uh, on political okay. campaigns when I was in high school and then continued in college. Oh, wow. And um, yeah, so I had worked in quite a bit of political campaigns. I worked in the New York Assembly. I worked for my congressman, New York Attorney General. I worked in the White House when I was in, in college. But at the same time, I was working in journalism. So I worked for a local television station. I worked for my college radio as well. Um, I did a lot of internships at uh, a national television station. So yeah, I liked I liked both of them. But I decided to, uh, to switch into journalism afterwards. Um, and then loved being in in Eastern Europe, it was an exciting time to be there. But right. um, but then eventually, I started working. I started volunteering actually with uh, Bosnian refugees when I was a journalist, and uh, because they were uh, a lot in Czech Republic and in Austria, where I also lived. And then I started becoming more involved in the development work. So um, that's what I'm, I'm working in now and writing in my free time. But uh, so we work with a lot of um, countries in development, helping to uh, with rural development and socioeconomic uh, development and gender and these issues. So, yeah, so it's, right. it's, it's nice. So I've had a lot of different careers, I guess, but, uh, but it's, but it's uh, something that's fun. Where'd you go to school at for that? So uh, I went undergraduate to, uh, to Cornell University in, in Western New York, and I studied mm. political science and history there. And then um, I got my uh, MBA with a uh, concentration in strategy and marketing in Milan, in uh, Epoconi University in Milan. Oh, wow. Yeah. All right, so all that time in journalism, did the political bug ever bite you and you had that feeling that you just wanted to run for politics at one point? <laughs> No, because I think I started in politics so early that I saw what it takes for a campaign. So I'm fascinated <laughs> by politics, right. but oh goodness, no, to do it myself, I, I work with a lot of politicians. So that's good because it taught me with it. But that's, yeah, that I'm, I'm always impressed when people want to put themselves out there and run for office. I, uh, I enjoy campaigns itself. I enjoy the communication side. Right. I enjoy the strategy side. But oh my goodness, no! I uh, no no desire. <laughs> then I live I in Italy. So you. it's in politics is you. another is another well, yeah. game altogether. <laughs> yeah, I don't blame you. I've had people. I've had several people try to get me to run, and I, I I don't care how honest you are. I don't care you know how, you know what you do for a living. If you get into politics, you're going to make enemies no matter what. Yeah. It's like I don't want enemies, yeah. so it's like forget <laughs> anything for me. So, <laughs> so what made you do do the jump? Even though you're already in journalism, but your your books that you've written are novels, and yeah. they're what historical fiction and regular fiction, right? So I I uh, and, write and short under... stories. Exactly, and short stories. But I think that the thread with them, I, I always write under women's fiction, which is defined really as, okay. a, you know, the, in, the internal journey. So usually you want to see the development of the person throughout uh, throughout the story. So uh, I write contemporary. I write historical because I really love history. And as you know, I live in a right. in an area with a lot of interesting histories. So it's exciting for me to explore it and put it into my stories. And also uh, discovering kind of these layers of history and, you know, looking at it from the modern perspective, looking back and, and discovering things. And then I also love short stories. So I do all three of them, but I think they're within the larger umbrella of women's fiction. And what was the first book you wrote? So the first book I wrote was Three Coins. And um, I don't okay. know if you happen to know, the, if you heard about the 1954 Hollywood film, Three Coins in a Fountain. It was a big production. Yes, I, love in the, I love the song, too. <laughs> Frank Sinatra. Frank Sinatra, who did yes. not have his name on there, he he didn't want to be credited. But I, yeah, if you if you just hear that song, you're humming it for at least for me the next week, the next two weeks. It's a fantastic song. And um, uh -huh. yeah, I thought it would be I thought it would be fun to have a modern retelling of it with uh, because the three coins in a fountain are three expatriate women in Rome in uh, in the 1950s. 
it's fun to watch that film now because, of course, the city has changed so much. I mean, there are no cars in 1954 Rome, which seems really <laughs> ideal to yeah. me. Uh, so when I watch it, I have fun. But I wanted to have it. So I have three uh, American women at various different stages in their life who probably wouldn't have met and become friends otherwise. But they're they're all um, at a difficult point in their lives. And they meet at a Italian resort a uh, beach resort, but off season. So they're kind of thrown together. And um, even though it's an okay. unlikely friendship, it winds up being what they need at that stage in their life. So they they come through this and they, they meet at this movie night of Three Coins in the Fountain. So it also has some reflection about, yeah, how it was for women uh, going abroad and living abroad in the 1950s. I mean, post-World uh, War II uh, Europe, which would have been quite incredible at the time and how it is today. Yeah. So it was, it was fun. And what year was that? Did that come out? So that came out in 2021, so in October. So I've, I've just been doing this. All three have come out in the last uh, year and a half. Wait a minute. You've released yeah. three novels. All right. For those of you listening, <laughs> not three books, not three short stories, three novels, not novellas, <laughs> novels in a year and a and, half? I'm kind of thick, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I, I no, I. As you can see, I love writing, so I've always liked telling stories. And so now that I finally put the time aside and and write them, um, yeah, that's been the nice thing is that I do write quickly. Uh, I have a lot of ideas that I love, and I and I see it through all the way through. But then the editing process takes longer. Then I have to go back and do the editing. But right. um, but the nice thing is is that I yeah I write pretty quickly, which is good. Wait a minute, you do the editing, so you don't have an no, editor. No, I work with an editor. So I uh, okay, so I I oh, write okay. the, obviously the story, and then I usually have trusted beta readers. So these are people who read the first draft, you know, cleaned up first draft, but they give their initial views on it. A lot of other fellow author friends and and things like that. Um, and then I go back and I do some more editing. Then I send it to my editor and she uh and she reviews okay. and comes back and then yeah then it goes to a then i read it again and then it goes to a proofreader what they don't tell you about writing is you read your own work at least 500 times it seems oh i, I and that's why i love talking to authors because i am so amazed by the differences between them all and and the way yeah. they work and everything they do and we just we just did a I did an author's podcast roundtable where I had Ooh, several different nice. authors on because I, I, I wanted to hear different that. approaches. Absolutely. And I, oh, well, I'll let you know. I'll send you the link. Um, but one of the things, and I I never heard another author say this until that day, and it made sense. And the lady said, "If you want to be a good author, you have to be a good." reader absolutely like, yes oh, that makes sense because i mean i would hope that every author reads <laughs> yeah but no 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 you you look you at other to. trades yes but you look at other trades like this with podcasting i can't tell you how many people i've talked to that do a podcast that don't even listen to podcast oh my it's like okay that's why would you do a podcast if you don't listen no. to podcast? Yeah, you know, no, just like, it's, why it's... would you write a book if you don't read books? Yeah, it's, no, you, you yeah, need to. I, you need to get an idea. Three novels in a year and a half. I'm still blown away by that. And you're you're not <laughs> self published, are you? You go through a publisher. Right? I am. No, no, no. I'm self. No, otherwise I wouldn't write with those rhythms. I am self published because the thing is that I I I well aside from the fact is that I have a career anyway so this is something i do in my free time so right i um what? i definitely wanted to, <laughs> i wanted to have control over it number one and i want to switch between genres which is a little bit more difficult in traditional publishing which is fair yes. enough they want to kind of brand you as one so i'd probably have to choose either historical or short stories um and the other thing is that because i write quickly uh, you know, it just takes longer in the publishing world. So I write and then I find my beta readers and then I have an editor with whom I work so I can line things up fairly quickly because my goal is to be writing two books a year. Um, and I'd like to continue wow. doing that. 
So yeah, I've I've already got my next one after the short stories is going to be going to my editor next month. So, um, and I've gotten lots of great beta feedback. So once once you have the system in place and you have really good people with whom you're collaborating, um, I think it's if there are you know other listeners who like to do that, I think that indie author can be really positive for that. All right, I I have to hear about this system. I mean, if you can't walk us, <laughs> well, I don't have a magic wand, but <laughs> because, well, but here's what gets me. I mean, because you still have a career, okay? You're you're doing that. Plus, you're, you're writing. Got apparently every day. It seems like if you're putting out three, if you put out three novels in a year and a half, and I'm sure you're not just sitting down the whole time. Do you, actually, do you work from home? No, you don't work from home. No, no, no. All right, but I live close to my, like? I live close to my office. <laughs> okay, so wait, when you wake up, walk us through your routine. Because I'm sorry, but I mean, you're telling me all, this is just amazing. I don't know how you can do it. <laughs> but there, there are a lot of people who write. And actually, I don't know if you happen to ever have um, – romance writers on your program but i have to say i mean yes. some people some people don't you know it's not the genre that i generally read the most let's say or anything but i am amazed by romance writers and fantasy writers are the two that are incredible i mean that doesn't seem like anything compared mm-hmm. to them because they write constantly and in fact when i first started i had a, a critique group that had a lot of romance writers in it and i must say they were amazing because they put out so much they're used to writing so much right. they you know even when they're they're published authors with a um you know in a traditional way they're expected to have probably three would be minimal of books, you know, per year. Mm -hmm. Um, And they write with incredible speed. It, it is training yourself to some extent, I think. And I'm, by the way, I'm not an expert. I'm, I'm, I consider myself starting on this career, but I do try to put in some writing time most days. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm not rigid about it because there are days that I simply can't, but um, even if I know I'm not going to have that much time, you know, even if I know I'm only going to get, you know, 600 words in, that's fine. I will do it to do it. And right. then on weekends and, you know, when I evenings, when I have more time, I can write a lot more. So it is, it is a little bit of a habit. Um, because I write historical, I do have wow. to do a lot of research for that first. So that let's say might slow it down a little bit because I have to do the research and, and really understand the time or what I want to explore. But, um, but I, I think to some extent, not everyone, but you can, you can train yourself to write fast and then again with romance authors and fantasy authors if you ever have them on (laughs) they're kind of the gold standard Mm -hmm. for writing for writing quickly all right i knew evelyn woods had a speed reading course but i never knew she had a speed (laughs) writing course (laughs) come on (laughs) we're this is now this is the other part that uh, you're probably going to blow my mind with this because this is something my wife does and I never understood how she can be reading more than one book at a time. Oh, yeah. So, in with you, way. with the three books in a year, mm-hmm. wait a minute, don't yeah. tell me you were writing all three at the same time. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I really How? understand your wife because I am uh, um, I am uh, not so monogamous in my writing <laughs> and my reading. <laughs> the only two things. Okay. Uh, yeah. So I do like to hop sometimes from book to book and especially because I like short stories. Now, the short stories I've been right. publishing for some years because short stories before I started publishing novels. I um, Some of those have been published in past years in anthologies or in journals. Some are brand new right. that I've just done in, in the last few months. Um, so sometimes I'll, I'll split up things with a short story too, which is also nice, right? You finish one thing and then you put in a short story, then you get going on another project. But I think it does help with the creativity when you, when you're jumping from time to time. Now I wouldn't do two things that are similar. So a lot of times I do a contemporary and an historical so that I mix it up a little bit. I probably wouldn't do two historicals in different periods at the same time. I might find that confusing, Um, but I do actually like it, but I'm trying to be better with that and work through one project all the way. So I'm going to, I'm giving that a try right now. We'll see if it works. So I take it when you do the historical fiction, that's probably what takes you the longest because of the research. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but I do a lot of it. I mean, I'm, there are a lot of things that I'm interested in living, especially living here in Italy, since uh, most of my stories are set in yeah. Italy. So uh, it's usually a time period or an issue or um, I'm very visual. So a lot of times there's a place that I really like that I want to use as the basis. And then I start doing the research and reading uh, other authors who wrote at the time to get mm -hmm. an idea. Um, I go a lot to the archives that are here in in italy which are really interesting and i go back and i look at the old um oh. newspapers uh right now i'm working on a project that will be a future project in fascist italy so i'm going back and looking at all of the uh basically the propaganda Ooh. news pieces of the time and reading them and in fact the director of this newspaper is benito mussolini so <laughs> you can imagine what i'm but it's fascinating and so you can just sit in there for hours reading through and and reading the the articles and that's getting me into so i do that part before i get the characters and and really get into the story wow holy cow amazing so it's fun so it's fun. as far as your writing goes mm -hmm. what's probably the most valuable piece of advice that was ever given to you about writing goodness so much but i think that the best thing that i had <laughs> yeah. here there are the I mean, unfortunately, everything, because I have to learn everything, right? But um, I think that getting a good writing groups, getting into, like, like I'm in the, the Women's Fiction Writers Association and the Historical Novel Society, mm -hmm. and actually I go to the conferences in that, since we were speaking about England, um, I go to the, the English conferences that they have for that in, in the UK, um, because you just meet so many like-minded individuals who are also writing that, you know, right. you become friendly with, you, I have writers groups that are within that, and they really understand the challenges, they understand understand what you're going through. They can give you advice. They can be a sounding board. Um, authors, I find, are very, very generous with their time and uh, teaching you what they learned and what they, you know, what they learned that does not work. And, um, and I find that specifically indie authors even more so because, um, yeah, they want people to succeed. It's still a growing area of, uh, you know, of books, but a rapidly growing area. So I think indie authors is specifically, you know, how they market, what worked, um, you know, kind of this types of things that we, we share a lot of that information. So I would suggest anyone who's interested in writing to, to find, whether that's your local group, whether it's a big association, get writing groups bounce your work off people because that that's that's mm -hmm. the best thing that i get out of out of those groups so i think that that's that's helped me the most i think actually the uh i'm, I'm glad you mentioned all that too especially the marketing because if you're living in italy and you're mm -hmm. really not on social media so and i'm sh i'm sure probably a majority of your books are probably purchased over there in Italy? No, actually, it's mostly in the U.S. Also here, uh, but it's mostly most of okay. my yeah most of my market is in the U.S. Um, I'm not on. I How mean, do I do have my blog. Oh, I'm sorry. I do have I do have my blog. I do have my author newsletter, and I do have uh, Instagram. I use a lot for for my work. Okay. Uh, I don't have I don't have Facebook. Um, but uh, yeah, I market it a lot that way. I get out through. Um, I get a lot of editorial reviews that gets out. I have been in a few newspapers when it's been reviewed and things like that. That obviously gets out. Obviously, okay. podcasts are great way to to reach out and then um yeah so it so actually the biggest market is the u.s uh and then a lot of other english-speaking countries but europe is i i do have to uh translate my work into italian which is what i plan on doing and then yeah because i speak italian i can well, that's also be participate fun. yeah that will be fun once i i've yeah. got to do that now so well, I guess then you're not coming over here to the U.S. for book signings, though, right? Unless you do them. Well, heck, you I do book should. I should. Well, no, you can do book <laughs> signings virtual now because you That's can true. sign them and actually have and send them to the people. Absolutely. Yeah, no, wow. I do a lot of, you know, a lot of virtual now are um, also you do book tours that are virtual. 
I have joined in on book yeah. clubs that are virtual. So I have joined in the U.S. Uh, for book clubs. Um, but yeah, I would love to do because libraries do such a great job of it, too. I would love to sometime on a visit back to the U.S. or when I retire from my job and this is my full time job, then I probably will go a little bit more often and do these uh, these types of things I'd like to do because it's nice to meet your readers. It's nice Kim, to talk I about writing. Kim, at the pace you're going right now, you'll be able to retire next year, probably. <laughs> <laughs> and then you have to break the news to your husband, say, honey, we're moving to the United States. <laughs> so, uh... <laughs> <laughs> with, uh, I, I'm just blown away, blown away by this, because one of the things I hear from a lot of authors, especially here in the United States, is... They're always struggling to sell books. A lot of them mm -hmm. don't know how to market. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they, they're they going to, they're doing book signings, which really doesn't seem to help a lot because, well, they're only doing them where they live. But your proof that it doesn't matter where you live, you know, people are going to buy your book no matter where they're at. And yeah. I just love it that the way you're marketing, you're not using social media a whole lot i mean you're not using facebook you're not losing book talk or whatever it is um whatever other ones you just have instagram and what link linkedin uh oh, no, you know linkedin have i have for professional for my work uh, for you know for my right, day job but i don't have yeah. for yeah um yeah i'm using a little bit a little bit twitter but a little bit less for books and and mostly instagram however i am working with a lot of people like when i do book tours who are doing that. So right. they also get your book out and that can help. Uh, TikTok, I will not use. I don't necessarily think for my genre. It's so I think it's very good for younger. You. Yeah, yeah, for various reasons. But it's more young adult and these things that I think it does very well. I don't think everyone should race to every social media uh, necessarily because, you know, TikTok can be great for, for getting things out. But I have had people who have made book talks uh, after reading my books and have done it that it's great because they do it and have it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm still at the beginning, but I do find a lot of these virtual book tours that I work with. Um, it's great because they, they just reach out to new audiences uh, and do it. But I, but I am a fan. I do think you should definitely do in your, in your areas, uh, book signings and things because it's, it, you have to keep oh, you getting have yourself to. out yeah. there. Yeah. And you, meet but I, I, you know. I think what I meant, what, what I meant by that was I see a lot of authors that that's what they focus on and they don't yep. reach out. They don't expand because one of the things, especially when I get a local author on, I always mm -hmm. tell them, I always tell them about pod match. Get yep. on as many podcasts as you can, because that's, Absolutely. that's going to help sell your books, which, yep. which we haven't even gotten into the part yet where I'm going to have you pitch your books. We've only talked about three <laughs> coins. I, I'm just always amazed by by the people themselves in general. Um, but no, I, I love the fact that you know, you're doing everything yourself. You're the way you're marketing is great. Now I gotta ask you. I gotta ask you this, and I hope I hope you're getting a lot. If not, then I'm going to be yelling at a lot of people. Um, a lot of a lot of reviews people leave are people leaving reviews full reviews for you on yeah your books. that i have to i have to get more of so people a lot of people read the book and this and i have to say before i started writing as an author I'm also not a person who always left reviews. Now, of course, I've changed entirely. Yeah. So I, I read books and I'm always reviewing because that also for your listeners, not if you read a book and you love the book, please leave a review because as we know, it is all the algorithms and this is how books wind up getting, mm -hmm. you know, uh, especially new authors you know this is how you get to be known so when people leave even if it, it does and i think some people get scared because they think they have to leave really long reviews three sentences two sentences that's that's fine yeah and that's that's a great way to get your books into the algorithm so that other people can uh, discover you so if you like author x and author y write similar books you know they will be able to put that together for your searches so um i think the best thing that you can do for an author and specifically for an indie author is leave a review 
<laughs> that's uh, that's like our Valentine's Day up Christmas with, altogether. I, I just came up with a crazy idea. So as a podcaster, I'm always asking for reviews, and I always do contests. So I'll, you know, like one of my uh, sponsors gave me gift cards. So if they leave a review, I'll pick them by random. But or you mentioned their name on the podcast. Here's a crazy idea. And you're probably going to laugh at me, say, Rich, you're nuts. I'm probably going to get a bunch of calls and emails from other <laughs> authors telling me I'm nuts. But <laughs> you have to throw everything out. You know marketing, what? right? You have to throw everything out there. Well, and I'm thinking because here you're you're working on other books. What if you acknowledge the people that leave you reviews by adding those reviews to your next book? Thank you, then. I know I'm nuts, aren't I? <laughs> no, no, no. I think actually. Uh... You know, with the book, the only reason that I say that is it might be hard because it's the it's the next one in there. But you're right. Usually, if you look at books now, and I'm the same way, in the acknowledgement session, you're mm-hmm. always thanking people for, for doing that. But I do a little bit in social media, and I think a lot of other authors do. We do tend to pull uh, reader reviews and highlight them and perhaps put them with social media visuals that are nice and give a call out to people to thank them for leaving, leaving the review. Um, But you're right. There is something uh, that could be something, I think maybe even with a newsletter or other things that you could do in a, in another way and and do it that. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's fantastic. Yeah. Cause, because the reviews you see in a, in a book, like if I buy a book today, Mm-hmm. The reviews on that book are going to be about that book. Yep. But if so, if I but if I'm looking after I finish reading that book and I look at it, reviews in the back about how this person loved your previous book, I'm gonna be yep. like, oh, wait a minute, I need to go back and buy that book now too. Yeah, that's that's. Damn, why uh, in I fact, get into marketing. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you come over to the book world entirely and we could use you? <laughs> no, it's no, it, I think Actually, that that's one of my goals this it. year is to start writing a book. Oh, good for you. I no, I, I think the more people in this, I, I think it's great. I think it's really um, challenging always, but I think it's, it's great. Mm-hmm. And if there's something that you want to do, then you absolutely should get going with it because it's one of these things that, you know, I hate having things that you want to do that are always back there and you don't do it, which is why I finally went ahead and started writing. Cause I always enjoyed it. Um, but it's, it's fun. It, um, uh, it's uh, it's a bug. You catch it, and then uh, then you can't let go. Yeah. So I'm not sure that it's always good, but it's uh, yeah, it's something that's worth it. So three coins. We've heard about that. What was the next book? And tell us tell us about the next book you wrote after three coins. Well, I'm sorry, the next book that came out after three coins, since you wrote them all at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> true, true. Um, no, the, the the next one is uh, Dark Blue Waves, and this I'm. Uh, what I should tell you, Rich, is that I'm um, a serial uh, title stealer. So three coins, as you know, was taken. Oh, from okay. Me. Thank God. I thought you were going to tell me you were a serial killer for me. No, no. I should make sure that's clear. <laughs> title stealer, book title stealer. Okay. <laughs> no, no. That that. Ooh. Definitely not. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I. Yeah, like it's to... just the way you said it because you're like Rich. I figure I better let you know that I'm a serial. And there's a little pause there. What well, would make for a yeah Thank an interesting God we're podcast? Doing this virtually. Absolutely not. No, no, no. <laughs> no, no. I'm a uh, title. I'm sorry. Go stealer. ahead, kid. <laughs> I steal. What titles. is a title stealer? I steal titles from other better known authors who are far more talented. So Dark Blue Waves is a line from a poem from Lord Byron. So it is a poem. Uh, So like three coins obviously comes from three coins in the fountain, Mm -hmm. right? Uh, But Dark Blue Waves is a story that I love because I um, really love Jane Austen. So read all, you know, I love uh, 19th century English literature. I absolutely adore Jane Austen. And when I went to Bath in the UK, which I'm sure you know, uh, it's just so beautiful. And I went there, um, 
well, you'll appreciate it. I went with my, my two boys when they were young and, uh, and mm -hmm. I, my husband wasn't there. I was on a solo trip with them. We were all around uh, different places in the UK and went to Bath and I had been doing everything for them. They were little, we were going to dinosaur museums, things like that, but I wanted to go on a Jane Austen walking tour. And so I, um, I told oh, wow. a little lie and I told them um, Jane Austen wrote adventure tales with dragons and knights and, sl and they, they realized very quickly that was not true, but I got my walking tour and I was very happy. And um, yeah, and I had this idea because walking around Bath, you already feel you're back in the 1800s. And I thought, wouldn't that be nice to do a time travel story based here of someone who comes here, knows a lot about English literature, right. knows the time, but goes back in time and is always getting in trouble, right? Because the, the written word is not the same as real life, right? So the first time that she has mm -hmm. to put on a corset, the first time she has to ride side saddle because she thinks she, and she's constantly getting into trouble. She can't remember dates from history because you study history, but you, she goes back in 1813 and she's not sure was the war of 1812 over in 1813 or are we still enemies? And so she's just getting herself in right. a lot of trouble. And so that was a fun one for me to write. And The Dark Blue Waves, because it's from a poem, uh, Lord Byron was, of course, contemporary poetry at the time. And everyone's talking him about him. I mean, I guess it would be the equivalent of a Hollywood celebrity today or a boy band or something. Everyone is speaking right. about Lord Byron. And she's read Lord Byron <laughs> boy band, in, her, like in her modern life, but she's never been that excited by him. But now she's rereading it in a different context. And he's speaking about, um, he, he wrote this poem uh, uh, in which he speaks about the dark blue waves carrying you off in adventures in new lands. And so she feels a real affinity with this because she's you know obviously in a new world here and yeah that was a fun one to write that is more of a it has a historical romance so um even though my stories are not romance okay. but they have some romantic elements uh some of my beta readers were romance readers for that and they said yeah but this could be it's women's fiction but it's also it's got a nice uh, romance story in it as well so that was fun yeah. because uh yeah because i had fun with the time travel and also a modern woman looking at the time, trying to make improvements, but trying to stay within, you know, the, to, to not be seen as crazy, mm -hmm. you know, trying to be careful about what she gives. So that one I had a lot of fun with and um, yeah, have had, have had some nice reviews on that. So that's been, that's been a lot of fun. And then, um, and yeah, I my can't third... wait to read these. <laughs> I hope you will enjoy yeah, it, and... that. Uh... Oh, well, and here's the thing. Cause a lot of people, yeah, especially a lot of guys I know, they're like, Rich, really? You're going to read a romance novel? It's like, look, when I have authors send me books, because to me, I think when I, I, and I love to read them afterwards because I, I, I use the Larry King method. Larry King never read any books before his author came on. I know that because, because I worked for Larry King years ago. Oh, I, really? Yeah. <laughs> So I, I just, worked. I an, love the fact that he as an did intern that. on Larry King, and yes, I know because the interns used to read them. I can, I can attest to that. <laughs> but uh, somebody asked him that question. He's like, "Why don't yep. you read?" And his his answer was great. He said, "If my listeners haven't read it, why am I going to read it? I want to yep. hear the author talk about it and basically sell me on it." You know. And yeah, I'm yeah, already no, sold true. on the first two that you told me. Yeah, but it, it makes a lot of sense. And I've heard yeah. other podcasters and interviewers that have talked to authors that have read their book. And sometimes the author can hardly get a word in because it's the host that's telling everything about the book. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think this is one of the like, fun things as an now. author. <laughs> no, I, I know that some authors don't like this, but I personally do. Um, when you write your book, obviously you're the closest to it, right? And as mm -hmm. I just said, you know, through the process, you read it so many times and you go back and you revisit. But I actually quite like it when people read your book, it's kind of then you send it out into the world. And then quite frankly, you're not that your work is done. You're still marketing, you're doing things, but how people interpret it is up oh, yeah. to them, right? And I, I often find that people are bringing their own um 
you know, their own perceptions to the book and to the reading. And I often find that the way people are interpreting it isn't necessarily what I had in mind, but they're, they're looking at it from a different perspective. Right. And I, I often find that very nice, you know, so that's, that's interesting too, because it could be that, yeah. you know, depending on where you are, where your regional is, what your interests are, people read different things into the, into the book too. So I, I think that is a, is a positive thing. I know not all authors love that, but I, I think it's great because I found also, even when you read books, um, I don't know if this was the case, like with your with your daughter and everything, but there are books that you read maybe as a teenager, right? Or things that we read for English literature classes mm-hmm. in high school, and then you haven't read them since then. Then your kids read them, and maybe you reread <laughs> And you see it completely differently reading it now than you did then, right? You're a different person yes. now than then. So this is how I liken it when other authors or when other people say it. No, because people are coming in with their own experiences and they might be interpreting certain things in a, in a different way. And, and that's not wrong. That's, that's, you know, our, that's our, the thing that we get out of it as a reader. It's like a song. I mean, you yeah, think exactly. about it growing up, the songs we listened to back then... Uh, and a lot of times it was because it had a great beat or whatever. Yeah. You know, you, you understood some of the lyrics. But then as you get older, you have, at least with me, I have more of an appreciation for it. And there's songs that I couldn't stand when I was younger. Yep. And I listen to them today, and it's like, oh, my God, man, that's a good song. Yeah. And, you know, the the lyrics, it's weird. The lyrics can be the same, but because of something that happened in your lifetime, sure. The lyrics have different meaning. And Absolutely. Yeah, the same way it could be the same way with a book, and I've seen it happen with prime example. And I bring this up a lot: "The Secret" by Rhonda Byrne. Have you ever heard of that? I know of it, but I haven't read it. Okay. Well, I read it. Well, let me rephrase that. I saw the movie first. Actually, the movie mm-hmm. came first. <laughs> then, the, since the movie was a, a success, she wrote the book about it and it helped me a lot it, it it's basically about the power of positivity how uh-huh. to align yourself the, the law of attraction so mm-hmm. i gave it to my gave it to my daughter to read she couldn't even get through the pe- first chapter because she said it was too negative <laughs> it's like huh <laughs> but so, the way she interpreted it was completely different than yep. the way i did no no absolutely so, well, this is why book clubs are fun too, right? Yeah. Because everyone comes with a different perspective oh, God, yes. to the same book, you know. And there are people who you even think you're oh, yeah. similar in books, but then you realize on certain books, no, it just doesn't. Uh... Which, which is why, you know, one of the other things is that I don't actually have, I mean, while I don't like them, I'm not going to say I love them, but I also, people often ask me, I don't really have a problem with negative reviews either. I mean, obviously I like it if people right. like my book, but... I don't really have a problem with that either because you you learn from them. Yeah, exactly. One, you learn from them. I always read them anyway to see what people like, what people don't like. But at the same point, I think it's completely would be unnatural if everyone, you know, likes, likes your your books. I mean, that's true. So I don't, you know, I don't, I don't take it personally. A lot of times there's negative reviews can bring more positive reviews too. You know, oh yeah, um, no, no, no. I don't. I don't. I, let's take a little break here. I want to talk about one of my sponsors, Maryland Pickers. Maryland Pickers is a local junk removal service, and they also have dumpster rentals as well. I actually called Jeremy when we were doing our spring cleaning this year, and he brought the dumpster out and quick to answer the phone. Came out the day he said he was going to pick it up. Answered all my questions. Everything was fine. Phenomenal. Very professional to work with. So if you're looking for junk removal service, if you're looking to rent a dumpster, contact Maryland Pickers. Go to MarylandPickers.com or give them a call at 443-206-1859. Again, that's 443-206-1859. Tell them that Rich from Hartford County Living sent you. One of the things I love, so there's a local writers group here. And they asked me to speak at one of their events, which I about podcast and not about writing because, of course, I'm not writing. Yeah. And they I they allowed me to stay and sit in afterwards. It was virtual, but they do. So they do the critique part mm-hmm. where everybody turns in something and they critique it. I thought that was the best thing I've ever yeah. seen when it comes to 
Yeah, especially young writers too. Yep. Now, if young writers, of course, they got it. They got to be able to take constructive criticism. Yep. But when I heard that, and it, I was like, "Ooh, ooh, man!" I was like, "This," and they're being straightforward, whether they Absolutely. love it or they hate it. But they're telling them what to do to change it. Absolutely. And I, I thought, no, that's, that's great. That's that's the f- best thing. That, and actually, that's what I meant a little bit when I said joining groups, because when you join these groups, you usually have uh, critique groups within it. And it's just the people, again, what we were speaking mm-hmm. about with everyone coming in from a different angle, everyone having ideas. Now, the problem is you can't take all those ideas because you start becoming a little bit, you right. know, make, you, but you take you. I get so much from, um, you know, observations or you're getting it from the reader's perspective, too, because there's something when you're too close to the work, you have it all in your mind. Right. And so you know what it is. And so yes. maybe there is something that I didn't explain well on the page that I should have been clearer or that I should have extra details or that I should. And so that's where they say, ah, yeah, but this there's something here that it seems to be missing something I don't. And that's, you say, Oh my goodness, it's true. I didn't, I, this was not clear enough. I do need to go back um, with my, with the book that I'm going to have after my short story collection. That's the first time that I worked with a group of not writers, but just historical fiction readers. And uh, they were my beta, some of my beta, because usually I work with other writers who are also great readers, but these are people who are not writers, um, but just historical fiction readers. And that was also useful too. So I used both. So I had a group of those beta readers with one of the groups with, with, uh, that I work with. And these are people who love historical fiction, just read tons of it, voracious readers. And they love to kind of discover books before they came out. And I must say that I got great feedback from them because they're looking at it specifically right. as a reader, not as a writer. Um, so, I yeah, no, that. I mean, I, I think all of it and I think absolutely the best advice I can give aside from joining groups that are, you know, that are going to help you along in the journey is one, uh, get used to constructive criticism because it's the best thing you're ever going to get and develop rhinoceros skin, I always say, because both for rhinoceros for, skin. you have to, if you want to be a writer, you have to have thick skin. You have to learn early on to, to do that, which helps you with the, it helps you one, if there are negative reviews or if people, and it also helps you with, you know, you think everything is perfect, but people come in and they, it's not clear to them, then it's not. If a lot of people are telling you this is not clear or this character, I don't understand what his motivation is. You better get back and re-edit and and make that clearer. I have to admit that's the first time I heard that term, rhinoceros. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, it's helpful. It's very, very, very thick skin, Uh, right? That that level of it. (laughs) In in life, it helps you, right, Rich? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, yeah. (laughs) Um, Oh, God. Well, I, I got a lot of I got a lot of constructive criticism when I first started doing these podcasts, and oh, sure. I I still I love it, yeah, you know, because this way it just helps me to improve and absolutely. Um, but yeah, in you know, anything you, you do, you need critiques. The, you need to get better. It's it's normal. Yes. Yeah. Now, unfortunately, nobody's been able to give me a critique on how to grow hair, but that's okay. Uh, <laughs> so. Your your third book. Yes. The one that so, I don't want to try to pronounce again. <laughs> you did it so perfectly in, in the shadow of the Apennines. So, oh. um, <laughs> yeah. No, that is a book that I, I, I also really had so much fun writing because uh, the Apennine Mountains, for those who don't know, so you have the Alps in northern Italy. And then you have what's called the spine mm-hmm. of Italy. It cuts right all the way along that boot of Italy are the Apennine Mountains. Um, and I am writing about a region that's called Abruzzo. It is, if you if people know where Rome is, Rome is within the region of Lazio. And right next to that region on the eastern side is Abruzzo. It's a very mountainous region. It was until recently, let's say, a very cut off region, even if it's close to Rome because of the mountains, because there wasn't very good, um, there wasn't a highway there until the, the 80s, actually. So there were just very small roads. Um, wow. and, the mount- yeah, and the mountains are quite, quite uh, rugged. 
so it could be very cut off and it was it was quite a poor region uh for much of history as well um and it's a region that i really love because i i love to hike i love to ski and um so i discovered abruzzo pretty pretty early on and um go out there a lot because it's just when you live in a big city it's nice to also get away from the big city <laughs> and in the end i'm used to snow so i do like to get out there i don't like living it necessarily but i like to go out there and enjoy it and and ski um and i don't know if you uh remember this but there was a really big earthquake there in 2009 with L'Aquila as the epicenter of the earthquake and it did a lot of damage and sadly a lot of death as well and it was it really affected the Mm. region terribly um and at that time uh, because I was going out there a lot and I knew a lot of people there um you know and I was asking them about this and they were all talking to me about this 1915 earthquake in a town called um Pescina, which is uh, a little town that was the epicenter of an earthquake in 1915. And that was really devastating. Um, Basically, in this little town of 5,000 people, 4,000 people died. But it hit in January. It was, uh, yeah, Rome promised to give, uh, to get help there. They did not. The people died very slowly. It was just absolutely devastating. And so I went to the town to go visit it. Um, And I I must say that if if any of your listeners go out to Abruzzo and visiting, stop by this town. It is well worth it. It's, It's absolutely beautiful. They built a new town close to the old town and left the old town as it was. Now we're talking about over a hundred years later, you know, the town is, is kind of a ghost town, except that some of the homes have been renovated. So there are people living next to, you know, these houses that were destroyed and have uh, trees growing out of them. So when I went there, I was so fascinated by this and I said, I have to write this. So I have, um, I have a dual timeline story of a uh, an American woman who a uh, modern contemporary American woman whose husband has divorced her. It's been a pretty acrimonious divorce. She's lost her uh, university job and she wants to start over. And perhaps a bit foolishly, she thinks she can start over in a little Italian mountain town and she moves there and she she quickly angers the residents. She starts off well, but then she angers the residents because she's writing a blog and saying not very nice things about them and they discover it. So she's quite cut Ooh. off. And in this, she discovers uh, journals and letters of a former resident in her home uh, who had lived there a century earlier who had been a shepherdess in this town um, of Pescina and uh, had wound up in this house. And so she winds up very slowly when she's cut off uh, going through these and discovering this life, which would have been a very difficult time with tremendous poverty. This is right at Italy entered a little bit later into World War One. So also right before they entered into World War One, and obviously all of the devastation that came with that. And this to me was fascinating because she gets to know herself through studying this, because she's felt very sorry for herself. She's also made mistakes, but she also learns about the history of the region. Um, You know, she's better able to uh, integrate into, eventually, into the region. A lot of the mistakes that she's made or things that she's done have also been uh, things that have been similar in some way, even of this very different person. So, yeah, it's it's also looking at history in a different way, looking back at a region that she does not understand very much and, and hasn't taken the time to understand that she winds up growing as a person this way as well. So I, yeah, I had a lot of fun writing that because, um, again, I read a lot of authors at the time. I've read a lot of the newspaper articles. I've, I've been to these places. I know Abruzzo very well. Most of the book was actually written there because I spend a lot of weekends out there. So I was... <laughs> I was writing right. it as I was there, but it's a fascinating region, and um, yeah, and I wanted to kind of bring that to life. So, so that was my 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 third novel. Have Have you had any travel agencies contact you? Because just from what you told me, and I haven't read the book yet, but now I want to come over there and visit. Yeah. Well, and, and it's not that far that. from Rome, so if you come over, then I'll sh- I'll show you. Yeah, no, you're right because there are a I lot mean, that of. That just sounds um, like it'd be amazing. There are a lot of uh, people from Abruzzo because because of, largely because of the poverty there and after the earthquake after World War One. Right. Um, 
it was a region where a lot of people moved from. So there are big pockets of people who are of Abruzzo origins in the US, in Canada, in Australia, and in, in UK and other countries. So yeah, it should be. I, I will actually be going to uh, an event in Abruzzo in the fall. So uh, with with oh, some nice. foreigners and things, but yeah, no, it would it would definitely be something that's a nice a nice tie in because it's a lot of the history of the of the region put in in a natural way. Yeah. See, Kim. Now we were talking before we started recording. This is why I can't come over there and visit my buddy because I won't. Leave. <laughs> you won't leave us. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just just from what you're telling me, and I've already got the picture in my mind, and we haven't even talked about food. Because I am, I can't. I mean, I want some true Italian cuisine, you know. Oh, that that God. that I put into the book as well, because she has to discover that, obviously, too. About the food, there's a little bit. There's a little bit. You'll 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 see that. All right. All right, so since you mentioned food, and before we get to the book that's about to come out, what is your favorite dish from Italy that you cannot get here in the States? Or even even if they do make it here in the States, can not even match the way it is over there? That's a tough one. You're asking me for one? <laughs> Um, no, I, I, I think that right, your top all... three then. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I have to say I'm a big fish eater. So I, I do, they, they do a lot of really nice things with, with fish. And also I love in this, you know, everything is very seasonal here. So you have certain dishes that only mm -hmm. come out at certain times of the year. So for instance, the first time that I go to the beach in the springtime, which hopefully will be soon if the weather continues, you know, then you have to have your spaghetti alle vongole. So you have to have your spaghetti with the clams, right. That are fresh and caught that day. And oh, I was going to say just... your what? <laughs> <laughs> so that's really good. And then, um, yeah, I don't know. The region that I was speaking about, Abruzzo, right? There they have a lot of lamb. So you have the lamb skewers out there. So the first time you go out to the mountains, they have the fresh lamb skewers. And they have festivals for that. So you can go and you can, and you can do that. Um, and then... I don't know. I know that my, because I have sons, right? They love uh, the, the bistecca alla fiorentina, the Florentine steak, which is made in a certain way. You cannot ask for it to be, they will only cook it in one way. I mean, they hate when Americans go there and they ask for it to be well done and they say no. <laughs> they only make what? it that way. Yeah, it has to be, it has to be pretty rare. Um, uh... But it's, it's really good. It's really good. It's worth it. Yeah, every region has its specialties. So you have to just go with what the locals say and you're not going to go wrong. So uh, so what's your favorite fish from over there? So that's a hard one too because they have a lot of good one. But I think that the um, – <laughs> or uh, maybe the orata is very good. The orata is like a um, – it would be sea base, uh, quite large. But you know, the Mediterranean fish are mm -hmm. different from the Atlantic fish. So yeah. you know, since I grew up in Boston before I moved to New York, I mean, I was used to really good seafood. But it's just different. I mean, they're they're the the, yeah. the fish taste different too with that. But that's really good, and they make a wonderful one under salt. They prepare it and cook it under the salt, which makes it even more tender. It's really good. Ooh. Oh yeah, I gotta get something. Tells me there's probably not a lot of vegetarians in Italy, are there? <laughs> well, you know the thing is, I don't think no, I don't, I don't. They, but you can. Uh, so, for instance, I, I as I told you, I lived in Prague for three years. I mean, there it's mostly a meat based right. diet, right? So, I think vegetarians actually did have a difficult time when they visited here. Here, you could easily eat. Um, you know, you can have pastas without seafood or without meat and everything you can oh, find yeah. food but but yeah i mean they tend to eat a lot of especially fish and um yeah and and, and meat and everything as well oh. <laughs> so i've i've convinced you <laughs> oh i i just said i've and this is something that always gives me people that travel when they go to other countries, and not just other countries, even here in the United States, when they go to other states, how they won't try different cuisine. It's like, 
You have to. You, you yeah. It's you'll enjoy it more. And I mean, I, I've the only places I've rarely been to is Japan and. Mm, they have amazing uh, food. Well, Guam, really. I mean, there's. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, um, the Japanese but are now, very. Luckily, when my you know. Oh yeah. Now, luckily, when my buddy came here from you know um, that lives in Italy now, because his wife is Italian, she's from there, and she made spaghetti or how did you say it? <laughs> yeah, it's I, I don't do it perfectly either. But as your friend will tell you, they do the double consonants, right? So spaghetti, you have to pronounce it longer. Okay. Yeah. And what she yelled at me because when I put it on my plate and then I smothered it in the sauce, yeah, yeah. she yelled it's at very me. Very little. She goes, "Yeah, what are you doing? No, you don't. Yes, just enough it, it, to. It's a, it's a little it. bit. Just, this is the thing it, yeah. to give it color. Yeah, it's just a little like, bit. We okay. we and I and I grew up too with my family putting lots of sauce on it. No, it's it's and I have to say I uh-huh. didn't like it for that reason. Then when I came over into Italy for the first time, I said, "Oh, this is so much better." So it's not a lot of uh, it's the flavoring. Yes. Mm, absolutely. Yes. Yeah, oh, but definitely. I agree with you and, with and trying to this day, the taste. That's the way I do it. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's it's true. So, but I, speaking of because what goes good with a good you know with good food. Excellent wine. Obviously. Always a good glass of wine, right? <laughs> right. Which brings me to the new book that's Very coming good out. Segue. And yes. this is a co- <laughs> this is a collection uh so this isn't like an anthology of the other short stories you did. The this book is all of your short stories, right? Yes. yes. And um and, all right, and what what is this book called? And this book, Rich, you will appreciate it. Not a serial killer, but a title stealer. <laughs> I did it again. I <laughs> this is again, as I told you, I go for I go for authors I love. Um, e. M. Forrester, the the British author, wrote a beautiful book about. It's not mm-hmm. his best, but he wrote a beautiful book about uh, Italy, which is called uh, "Where Angels Fear to Tread." And he had a line in there that was so perfect. So, of course, I stole it part of it for my <laughs> for my title. Um, it is speaking about you know when people used to go on the great journey from the UK to Italy by horse and carriage, right? So they would have to go through the Alps at a certain time of year because then the snow would start and you couldn't go through. So you could only go at springtime. And he talks about this long journey into Italy and he speaks about going from um, so he's speaking about northern Europe obviously but he's speaking about it as where uh, that the vegetation changed and as they moved into Italy the rivers became Mm -hmm. wider and the mountains became lower and the people stopped ceased to be ugly and drink beer and instead began to be beautiful Drink, drink wine and be beautiful. So I just love that line and I thought it was great. And so what did I do? I <laughs> I do have that line in the first page of my book so that I it is pro- properly attributed to uh, to E.M. Forrester, but it's a fabulous line. And um, yeah, so all my stories drink are... Drink wine are sent- and be beautiful. I love it. I know. <laughs> I... I mean, I think it's great, obviously, for many, many reasons. But uh, but yeah, no. Um, and so it's all stories that either uh, with Italian women or expatriate women in Italy or Italian women also abroad and everything. Mm-hmm. So that's that's what ties it together. But um, yeah, those are contemporary stories. And uh, hopefully if people like armchair travel, there are a lot of cities and towns and everything in there and uh, and places so yeah i think it's kind of a, a little uh virtual passport hopefully people will see it but all different women in different stages of their lives very different different backgrounds and right and yeah i had fun writing that one so how many stories in it total there are 21 21, 21 stories okay. yeah Obviously, I don't want you to tell us all about all twenty-one of them because then, if you tell us about them, then everybody, you know, people aren't going to buy the book because uh, you, you just told us about the whole book. Uh, but if you can tell us about three of your favorite, without going into the whole short story, because you know, short story, sure, short, sure. Uh, but tell us about three of the fa- your favorite ones from the book. 
Wow. But you're kind of asking like, you know, choose your favorite child. No, <laughs> no, it's not that I like, you know, since I like it, since I wrote all the stories, you know, that. it's hard to choose my fate. <laughs> No, I'm teasing. Um, yeah, so I don't know. I, I, I as I said, I, I since I write women's fiction and this is about women uh, and their interior journeys, it's showing different aspects of it. So, you know, one that I enjoyed because uh, I don't know if you know, in, in Rome we don't obviously get snow very often, but um, in the last. 10 years we've gotten it twice which has been pretty impressive you know seeing Rome in the snow uh so one of my stories it's a Roman snowstorm that just puts uh, the airport in chaos a Fiumicino and so mm. the uh passengers have to stay overnight and um yeah that that action really changes to women incredibly just the what happens within that night and just causes them to reassess their lives and everything from just that that one experience because I like this idea I like this idea that you know one little action can can change entirely how you think about your life and and kickstart things to be to be different um one of the stories is uh which also takes place in Rome is a um a woman who comes over rather naive very young uh to to rome and um after a difficult first meeting she winds up meeting someone who's going to become you know her her best friend in life and uh and you know from going from misunderstandings mm -hmm. to just being you know such a strong friendship that 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 lasts a lifetime um and then I have another story, which is a uh, very introspective of a woman who uh, is an Italian woman who goes to Bali, which is a trip that uh, her husband has always wanted to take with their son, but it just hasn't uh, mm. worked out until now. But now she's going alone without her husband. And it's a time of introspection, being in another place and, and looking at things a little bit differently. So, so then we discover that uh, there. So yeah, they're all, they're all different stories. Again, looking at different, different aspects of it. I mean, I look at family, I look at friendship, female friendship, relationships, starting relationships, ending relationships. So there are a lot of different, different right. aspects there. And this one, drink wine, be drink wine and be beautiful, comes out in May, right? May exactly. 26th, yes, was it? it is the twenty sixth of May. Okay. Excellent memory. And if you have any of your readers who are on NetGalley, I hope you don't mind me making a plug, but you have uh, advanced reader copies. No, on I never Net heard Galley. of NetGalley. What is that? Oh, it's great for for authors. It's wonderful because you have your advanced reader copy up on NetGalley for some months before the uh, publication okay. and that's when readers and I'm a big net galley reader myself. I mean, not just as a, as an author, but I go there and I read a lot of novels and give reviews and, and promote huh. them a little bit. So if you have any of your listeners who are on net galley and like short stories and uh, like Italy and would like a little virtual escape, please, I would be very happy if you want to request my novel for, to read and, and review. Oh, that's awesome. I'm gonna now. I got to check that out. Jeez. I know NetGalley so winds up getting you in books, a <laughs> gets me in trouble. No, because there are so many. There are so with many your books. books. Something very important. Oh, good. No, uh, just that no, I said well, there are so many books on NetGalley. Actually, I'm 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 glad you mentioned that too. Because with your books, are they also in audiobook form? They are not yet, and that is a mistake. I want to get them. I, I have been in touch now to see about I'm, I think I'm going to start within the shadow of the Apennines and get an audio version of that as well. Okay. Are you going to narrate it yourself? No, I'm going to pass that over to an actress. to. Why not? <laughs> No, I think it, I, I I think I'd also prefer just listening to a different voice and uh, and doing that. So no, absolutely. I think uh, oh, you no, you know there are a lot voice. of <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I'm sick of my voice. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's nice to you know you do everything else. You do your own marketing. You do this. It would be kind of nice to just have someone else, and then I can sit yeah. back and and listen to someone else's voice, which I think is lovely. So. Yeah, and I get tired of listening to my own voice too. And I got voices <laughs> in my head all the time, so <laughs> So you have to write a book. You have to let them out. Otherwise they just stay there. Yeah, that could be dangerous. <laughs> Kimberly, tell everybody your website and where they can get your books. 
Yes. Uh, thank you, Nona. Uh, definitely. Uh, I would love for you to visit my website. It's Kimberly Sullivan Author dot com. Um, I send out a newsletter. So there's a sign up there if you would like to get the newsletter, which has uh, always yes, some book news, some travel news, throw in something for food every once in a while, too, because why not? And um, <laughs> And all, because I live in Italy and it's the law, I think you have to. And um, no, so in, in all of my books, all of the information is there. And I certainly hope that um, people might like one of one of the stories. And if you do read my book and, and enjoy it, please do read a, leave a review. You know, it's a shame you can't ship wine from Italy to here because with mm. your new book, you could always ship it. With a bottle, you know, with a bottle of wine. That would be great. That would be great. <laughs> well, actually, I or or else do a wine I just... tasting. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. And, but that you gotta add be... some recipes in there too. God, <laughs> and, I like and, cooking. Yeah. So this one's coming out in. Mi- What's that? I like cooking, so why not? Every once in a while. Have to... <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, I'm the cook in my family. I love cooking. Um, <laughs> God, there we go with food again. I forgot what I was about to say. I know, we keep say. going Jeez. back to it. Oh. Rich, now you're asking me. I'm God. not Italian, and I know it's, but are you well, sure you're not? Are you sure you're not a little bit Italian? Nah, Irish. Hmm. Me, well, nah, I, I, I guess. According <laughs> to Ancestry DNA, I'm not. <laughs> I think they missed something. Scottish, There's got to be Irish. something. <laughs> I'm a mutt. I might be. I'm a mutt. I'm a mutt. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> so the the blah. God, rent it lips here. So, drink wine and be beautiful is coming out in May. You're already working on another novel. You said right. Mm-hmm. And when are you hoping that the new novel will be released? That will be going out very soon to my editor. So I'm working on the re-edits now after Beta Reader. So um, that should be out in October of uh, 2023. So that will be out in the fall. And uh, All right. When are you going to go and take a vacation? <laughs> oh, no. I, I do take vacation. Don't I? <laughs> I love vacation. Okay. That's a... No, no. But it always gives me more ideas for books. That's the problem. So <laughs> Yeah. God. Well, Kimberly, I want to thank you so much. It's it's been a pleasure and a joy and the doors open when you want to come back on and promote your other books. I would say come on for each book, but that means you'll be on every month. <laughs> Rich <laughs> I, I wish I were that productive, but no, but absolute a pleasure from my side, Rich. Thank you so much for, for asking me or to be on your podcast. And um, no, thank you so much. I've had such a fun time. And we, we spoke a little bit, maybe too much about food, but we'll, we'll prepare the recipes and everything for new food discussion next time. <laughs> uh, you, you send me some recipes. I'll send you some of my barbecue recipes. Oh, good, good. <laughs> Deal? Deal. Absolute deal. <laughs> now, I know, you, I know you don't have snakehead fish over there. Well, you might. I don't know. But, you know, I, I, that's a good fish for you to try. Okay. All right. I'm, <laughs> I'm open to anything. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Kim. Thank you. Thanks so much, Rich. I have really got to stop doing this. It never fails. It seems like whenever I have somebody on, we always end up talking about food. I don't get it. Anyways, I want to thank Kimberly for coming on. And make sure you go to her website, KimberlySullivanAuthor.com. Sign up for her newsletter. Check out her books. Make sure you purchase them. And when you read them, leave a full review. Now, here's something funny. When it comes to recommending a podcast... Uh, you're not going to believe what I found. I found a podcast called Kimberly's Italy. And it's not the Kimberly I just spoke with, but, well, just check out the trailer. Let's talk about all things Italian. The incredibly delicious pasta, risotto, ravioli, osso pizza napolitana, tiramisu, the entire 
Italian cuisine, the countless varietals of full-flavored and divine wine. The Italians with their rapid-fire speaking, with both their hands and their mouths, welcoming and friendly people who are infinitely proud of their rich history. The crazy driving, art and architecture, so beautiful, it stops you in your tracks. So what's not to love about Belle Italia? My name is Kimberly Holcomb, and I moved to Milan when I was 30 to further my fashion photography career. I arrived with $5,000 in my pocket and expected to stay maybe six months, but I ended up staying six years because I fell hard for Italy and the Italian people. I explored every inch of the country while living there and kept a record of each unique place I went to and all those cultural festivals that were definitely different from my upbringing. I didn't know you could have a competition rolling wheels of Pecorino in the main piazza. Eventually, I had to move back to the States due to EU regulations, yet I continued to go back once a year or so to see my friends and explore a few more places that I hadn't been to yet because somehow I knew that Italy would be part of my life forever. And luckily, it's played out exactly that way. After many years in New York City, I decided to pivot from my fashion photography career and start a travel planning business specializing in Italy, of course, and only Italy. Hence, Kimberly's Italy was born the end of 2018. My timing was not opportune considering Italy shut down with the onslaught of COVID. However, my partner in life, Tommaso, as I call him, suggested that I start a podcast and talk about my love of all things Italian. I agreed to his idea, but only if he would be my co-host because he loves Italy as much as I do. As well, he's a tech geek, a guru of all things digital, and he knows how to produce a podcast. So here we are. We will share with you all kinds of stories from our travels and also the types of places that perhaps you couldn't find on your own. For example, how to drive over the rugged terrain of Northern Sardinia to a family farm that will serve dinner to anyone that can actually find the place. Or how to hike on a trail with absolutely no signage, high above Lake Como, toward the Swiss border, to a mountain refuge where you can spend the night and be greeted upon your arrival with a heartfelt hug from La Mama. Or for those of you who prefer urban travel, we will share with you where to not leave your car in Rome and tell you how to stamp your ticket on the tram in Milan to prevent you from being escorted off it by the Carabinieri. As I mentioned previously, this podcast will be about my love of all things Italian, the history, the cuisine, the people, and most importantly, how you can enjoy Italy as much as we do. You can find us on all podcast platforms and you can listen to the episodes directly from my website as well, KimberlysItaly.com. Thank you so much for joining us. Grazie mille e ciao ciao. If you would like to be a guest on the podcast, or if you would like to recommend somebody for me to get on the podcast, or if there's a topic you want me to talk about, just go to conversationswithrichbennett.com. Click the Be a Guest link and fill out the form, and I'll get in contact with you, and we'll get everything set up. And while you're there, please subscribe to the podcast as well as the newsletter. And check out all my sponsors and, of course, my co-hosts. Please show your support for all of them as well. Until next time, my name is Rich Bennett. Stay safe, and thank you for joining the conversation. I want to share an amazing experience I had with Tar Hill Construction Group when I needed to install a new roof on my home. Let me tell you, they are truly a cut above the rest. Tar Hill Construction Group is an award-winning residential and commercial roofing and exteriors contractor focusing on roofing, siding, gutters, and solar solutions. Proudly serving Baltimore, Hartford, and Cecil Counties, they make it their priority to make a positive impact in the communities they serve first while providing exceptional services in roofing and exteriors. From start to finish, Tar Heel Construction Group proved to be a reputable and dependable contracted solution. Their quality installations and good communication kept me informed and reassured throughout the entire process. 
It's no wonder they have been voted Harford's best roofing contractor and best home improvement contractor for three years running. But here's what really impressed me. Tar Heel Construction Group's commitment to continued service and registered warranties. They stand behind their work, ensuring that I have peace of mind for years to come. What's even more remarkable is their dedication to giving back to the community. They aggressively support and uplift the neighborhoods they serve, making a positive difference in people's lives. I feel incredibly grateful and humbled to have chosen Tar Heel Construction Group for my roof. They have earned my trust and respect for being the only contractor to be voted Harford's best roofing contractor and Baltimore's best roofing contractor in the same year. So if you're looking for top-notch roofing and exterior solutions, look no further than Tar Heel Construction Group. Visit their website at tarheelconstructiongroup.com or give them a call at 410-638-7021. Again, that's 410-638-7021. Experience the excellence and community impact for yourself. Tar Heel Construction Group, building excellence one roof at a time. 